Washington Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name. Politics is our game. And we will be doing lots of politics this evening because we have as our guest Karen McConaughey. I should say politics and pol public policy because Karen has been involved in public policy and, public and politics for, what, the last two decades, right, mm -hmm. Karen? Yep. She was elected first to the Kane County Board in 1992. Right. And then in 2004, she became Kane County Board Chairman. She has been serving in that position till the current date and, and beyond, we should say. We're taping this show on January 22nd, 2012. She would now like to be a state senator. She is running in the Republican primary. That's Karen McConaughey. She is running in the Republican primary in the 33rd district. We were just talking before the show. Where is that? It's way out west, right? The district runs from uh, Batavia at the south end all the way up to Crystal Lake and, and roughly kind of more or less follows the western edge of the Fox River. And, you know, so folks, if you don't live out there, don't change that channel or I'll come get you. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to be talking of issues of interest to people throughout the state of Illinois because that's what we do. People want to know about education. They want to know about taxes. When they stop you in the street, Karen, and they say, you're here, you're running for the state senate, they want to know what your views are in education. Right. They want to know if you'd like to repeal the income tax. They want to know how you're going to fix the pension funding mess right. and get things. You know, people have a sense that everything's gone astray. They've gone, yes. gone putting it bluntly, Illinois has gone to hell in a handbasket. Would you agree? I would. Okay. I would. And so if you go down to Springfield, you bring all your experience, and somebody says you've got a $90 billion unfunded pension liability for state employees. It's a real mess. The state needs to do something. Give us the one-minute answer. What would you do to fix that problem of the unfunded pension liability? I think, I think we have to make a change. Uh, that was a good first step for future employees. But for the existing employees, we just frankly can't continue the rich benefit package that they have. Uh, uh, Tom Cross has, a, has introduced a three-tier approach that I think makes a lot of sense. And I think that the state legislature needs to address that. That needs to be the top priority. And you support to. that unequivocally? I, absolutely. Now, some people would say, aren't you violating the Constitution there? Because these are current employees. And true, these benefits haven't accrued yet, but the Constitution says something to the effect you can't diminish the compensation of current employees, something to that effect. Right. Um, there's a difference of opinion on that, whether or not that's accurate or not, and, and I'm willing to test it. I think that it, what's really important here is to recognize that when a, a pension benefit is richer for uh, government employees than it is for anyone in the private sector, something has to change, and we cannot continue. We can't leave this for our children and our grandchildren, the, the debt that has been incurred here. Does that mean turning, taking some of these folks and saying basically you're going to be on a 401k if you don't want to pay more, and you're not going to have that rich retirement uh, fixed benefit that right. you would get otherwise? Uh, you know, sadly, I think that's what we do have to say, because how many people do you know in the private sector? Uh, who, who have, have a been right. rich pension right. system. Right, who have, well, they have, they have 401ks. Kind of they have, if they're lucky, they have 401ks. Exactly. They have 201ks, right. as you said. But, but their <coughs> retirement is not as rich as it used to be. I don't know many people in the private sector. The people who we, as, as uh, taxpayers, pay the bill should not be providing a benefit package to state workers that's richer than the kind of retirement benefit that we receive. So that fixes some of the problem. What would you say the budget is roughly? Give me a ballpark number. On, for, on, for the state of Illinois right now, for, as we speak. God, that's a good question. I know that the... The general revenue the, fund, would you say it's like $30 billion, $33 billion, it, something like that? It, it probably is. It probably but is. You're not sure, but somewhere I am not, in that. I am not sure. You're going to find out. I'm going to find out. Come back and tell us. I can us. tell you all about... When you come back for this debate, we're going to have with your opponent, and you're going right. to do that, right? Right, absolutely. We're going to talk about all the specifics, right. what the budget is, what it should be, and so forth. But, but, but so roughly right now, you talked about you're going to have to deal with the pension. Well, the pension... What else, what do you else do you have to do? Because right now... We barely have a balanced budget after raising tax revenue about $6 billion. That's the impact, I think, of raising the state income tax from 3% to 5% on the individual level, and I think from 4.8% to 72 on the corporate level. Sound about right? Right. Sounds, sounds close. So that gave $6 billion, and the state, I think, had maybe a slight surplus, slight deficit, but they were right in there, pretty close. And now the Republicans, the GOP, the Illinois Republicans in the House and the Senate, I think, have come together through Tom Cross and through Christine Rodonio, correct me if I'm wrong, so and said so they would like to repeal that income tax increase. Exactly. And Pat Quinn and other Democrats say, how could you do that? We'll be back with a $6 billion deficit. What do you say? You want to be a leader? Say something happens to Chris, she's not available, and Chris says, run out and explain this to 
if you will, Karen, mm -hmm. to the governor as to how we can repeal the income tax and still have a balanced, solvent situation. Well, I think you grow revenue by cutting back on the constraints we've put on local business so business can grow, so our economy can grow. That's that's where you find the revenue. The growth. The growth in our economy is is More taxpayers. Answer. More taxpayers. Not more taxes. Exactly. You're in exact exactly. agreement with your opponent, Cliff Sergis, right. because that's the, that's the saying he used. You yeah. saw that show when he yeah. was here, right? Yep. Yeah. So yeah. you folks are in sync. Yeah. On taxes, you both want to repeal the income tax. Absolutely. Okay, and you both pretty much we didn't. I don't know if we went through that with Cliff, but he before that pension reform, I think we did I would think that you so. talked about. I would think so. So you're in agreement there. I don't know many Republicans who aren't in agreement. He on says that. Medicaid's a big issue. You've got to get so. a control of that. You agree? I agree. But how do you do that? You got a lot of low-income people out there. Health care costs have blossomed and have gone up rapidly. Do we just say to these low-income people? You just don't deserve health care. I think I think that we've got we can accomplish a lot by uh, verification. Uh, whether or not there's a whole lot of folks that they sign up for Medicaid once and then we never verify if they still are eligible. So we got a lot of people who shouldn't be on the dole who are on the dole. Well, we don't know that for sure. How do sure. we even know? But chances are pretty good that it's being abused by all indicators. So Newt Gingrich says go out to somebody like American Express, one of these other credit card companies. They they know how to get at fraud contract out with them and say, find out who's fraudulently on Medicaid. Would you support that approach? Uh, contract out to the private sector how you find out who's, who's, who's um, defrauding the state of Illinois and then design a program to deal with it and then save, I don't know, a few billion dollars. Does that I, sound right? I think that any time that you can contract to the private sector because they do something better than we do in government is always a good idea worth exploring. Um, but I, but I think okay. that they, we've the legislature has passed some uh, changes to Medicare qualification that the federal government has not uh, validated yet, and I think that's one of the things that we need to press harder <clears throat> at the federal level to to get that concurrence from them so that we can begin to do a better job of verifying. We have to get waivers or concurrence from the federal government to do some things with Medicaid, their approval right. to reform Medicaid right. to lower the cost to make it more efficient. Right, but. Is there one thing, if, if you said, I'll say I'm John Citizen, Jane Citizen, I run into the street and I say, I don't know, it sounds very complicated, but I got this guy Cliff Sergis, I've got Karen McConaughey, I know you're both running for the state and the Republican primary, that person says, I'm a Republican. On this one issue of Medicaid, you both said that we should somehow reduce Medicaid costs. Can you tell me how you're going to do it better than Cliff? You know, I, I'd like to try and look at some of the things that we've done in, in local government. Uh, wellness programs uh, are, are one of the ways is to really, really create some incentives within the Medicaid system and that really push the medical community towards getting people into taking a more active role in preventative medicine and better disease Better control. diet, better right. exercise, right. maybe that's even really get the these key. people involved in right. things that make them and maintain their health. That's what I, that's what I did with our, our health insurance program at the county. I have nine different bargaining units and, and what was one of the key things we negotiate, let's get our employees into a wellness program. By doing that, we have already begun to reduce the overall cost of health insurance uh, that the taxpayers are, are picking up. We estimate by making that change and getting that buy-in from the employees that we are going to recognize next year close to two million dollars in savings in health care costs for just for our employees. Those kinds of concepts yeah. about about wellness and getting people to invest in, in their own health uh, make a clear difference yeah. in the cost. So uh, <clears throat> basically we want to allow people to in a sense mimic their higher income friends because high-income people tend to be involved in wellness programs. We know a lot of executives have programs designed to keep and to make their executives healthy, the companies do, and on the private sector because they realize that's a valuable asset, so we want our incentive, we want our executive to exercise, we want to make it easy for that person to do so. We want to transfer that kind of relationship down to the lower level employees and people indeed who may not have a job but are looking for a job. Let's, let that, let's make it easy for them to exercise, right. easy for them to have a good diet, and therefore, the, in the long run, the costs will be less to take care of those people. Well, and I think is that also, the idea? I think that's part of it, but I also think uh, um, creating an incentive for the medical community to really focus in on with Medicaid patients. Um, the the system kind of really dr drives the type of health care yeah. they're receiving, and I think so. Their compensation, in a sense, would be tied not to just the things they perform, the procedures. Right. But if they could figure out ways to motivate their patients to come in for regular visits, to catch things early on when the cost of dealing with it is less, right. 
and to and to motivate their their clients if you will to exercise and do all those things we will pay that doctor for that motivation for those skills as opposed to paying them for expensive procedures right right, right. and the idea we'll, is we'll incentivize time. them right. to do this right and over time you'll have less people who are ill right. who need very who are requiring very very expensive medical procedures and, and costs but the state so the state's very involved in health care through Medicaid, and that's shared with the federal government. And there's this thing called abortion. You know, it mm -hmm. comes up from time to time, especially yep. in Republican primaries. Mm -hmm. What's your view? Are you pro-life or pro-choice? I am pro-life. Pro pro You're pro-life. So what does that mean? Would you like to see abortion completely illegal? I would. Would the how, allow an exception for the life of the mother? That's the only exception I would allow. Not for rape or incest? No. Okay. And what if a woman walks in now and wants to have an abortion should Medicaid take care of it if that woman doesn't have the income to go no, and pay for an abortion? Why, why should we as taxpayers be funding that? It's well, not because it's a legal procedure. Uh, Roe v. Wade well, and the Supreme Court has said, be. but the Roe, Roe v. Wade has said that it's a constitutional right. It's the law of the land now. It could no. change in the future. Shouldn't the state of Illinois be covered no. by the law of the land? No, I don't think government should be paying for. Uh, why should government be paying for a woman's abortion? Well, because many women view this as uh, part of, of health care, of reproductive health care. And so just like we would pay for a procedure that that woman might need that wasn't related to reproductive care, why shouldn't we pay for it if it is reproductive health care? It's a legal procedure. It's a legal operation. If a wealthy woman wants to have an abortion, we're not preventing her from doing that, right? right. Right. Why should we say to a low-income woman, well, if a low-income woman needs to get her arm fixed because she has a broken arm, we don't quibble with that. We say, you got a broken arm, we'll pay for it. That's and now a, a woman says, now I have an abortion. I have a pregnancy. That's a choice. I don't want to have a pregnancy. I mean, I want to abort. It's legal to do so. And you're saying, no way. It's not a life or death question for that, for that woman. Okay. That is a moral choice that she made. Um, I do not agree, as a taxpayer, that we should be paying for that. As far as you know, your opponent, Cliff Surgis, agrees with you. I, I, you know, as I, as I told you earlier, I think when it comes to these kinds of issues, we're probably very much same. on the same page. Same thing about gun owner rights, mm -hmm. gun control. Mm -hmm. Do you think we should have a ban on assault weapons? We no. don't. We used to have one, didn't we? Was it on the federal level? We, I do not believe we should. I'm a we big shouldn't. Second Amendment. Why does somebody need an assault weapon? Why is it our Henry Hyde, government? I once asked, not Henry Hyde, but I once asked Phil Crane. You know, Phil Crane used to be a congressman, and his answer was many years ago, well, Jeff, whatever melts your butter. Would you agree with Phil on that? Well, I'm not sure I agree with you how might to answer that question. But, <laughs> but if I'm a law-abiding citizen and I, I am a safe individual with guns, is it really the government's business? What kind of a... What, no, but what, what do you... I mean, assault weapons, as you know, are often used for criminal behavior. Right. And they're not used for... Uh, often not used for writing. sport. Right. But, you know, if you, have, if you don't have a ban on assault weapons, the bad guys can get and will get assault weapons, and they're going to mow down people in the streets and people in Chicago who a four-year-old might be sleeping in her bedroom, and she may be randomly shot by somebody who just rips off, you know, 20 shots within 20 seconds. Oh. And assault weapons... I know we get into the definitional issue, right. but do we really want to say that because people should have a gun for sport and a gun to protect themselves, as the Second Amendment says, they should also definitely be able to reel off 30 shots in 30 seconds, assuming that the assault weapon would get at that and prevent right. that? Maybe they could get a gun, but not something that shoots them quite so quickly. Would you think that might be a good idea? Well, Jeff, I can't believe that even you think that banning assault weapons is going to keep assault weapons out of the hands of criminals. Well, it would diminish it. It raises the cost. I, I mean, you've, you, you know. said you read this book, right? I, it's been One of our favorite books that we promote from time to time. We don't promote. Well, we do. Yeah, you do. Milton That's Friedman, right. Capitalism and Freedom, right there. Requi it should be required reading. Right? Yeah, for watching public affairs and for just for in general. We should balance things out, right? I mean, we should have this required reading, but maybe required reading something by Jim, John Kenneth Galbraith. You know, Friedman and Galbraith used to debate. We're for you for that exchange of ideas, right? Absolutely. All right, but anyway, so you can't get anything done in government without an exchange. But Friedman of ideas. would point out when you raise the cost of something, you get less of it. When you lower the cost of something, you get more. So I've never talked. I didn't talk with Milton when he was alive about that particular thing. But I think he would say, well, if you raise the cost to owning an assault weapon, you will get fewer people owning them. Do you dispute that? You know, I You I won't eliminate I, it completely, but, you know, you'll get fewer people and you'll have fewer bad guys having 
assault weapons, and you may get fewer people getting shot in Chicago. Well, you're, who you're are operating on a premise that there will be less assault r weapons in the hands of criminals by, and I don't By raising the cost, because right. the criminals react. They they're, 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 they're irrational, don't you think? No. You don't really? think they are? You, don't okay. think, you think criminals are irrational? All right, so you, you would not like to see a ban on assault weapons. You, no. And as far as you know, Cliff would agree with you on that. I guess, I would assume. On, on gay rights, same-sex marriage? Uh, I am live? for that. I would vote civil against. Unions? I would, would you have vote civil to, unions? Well, it's already law. Uh, would, I would you have vote supported that if you, were, no, if you had the opportunity? Have, I would you would not, not have voted for civil it, unions. And I would vote to repeal it if, if that comes up for a vote. So you are a down-the-line economic conservative, social conservative, and if we had national defense in there, which we don't for the state of Illinois, you'd be a down-the-line national defense conservative because that's God. people, isn't that what they say for the conservative movement? Uh, I think they say nationally has a three-pronged chair. There's the economic side, there's the traditional social issue side, and there's the defense side. And just so people can get a fix on your philosophy, you are a three-pronged stool, social, right. economic, military, without going into that. Right. You're a down-the-line conservative. Right. Yes, I mean, I'm still thinking about Ronald you. Reagan would be proud to have you yes, for a daughter. Yes, he would. Yes, he would. He would. I'm just or thinking a wife, about for that your, matter. Yeah, your, that idea that you posed uh, a state of Illinois getting involved in national security issues, uh, I perish the thought, but anyway. Yeah, probably not. That's probably Although, not. Well, I don't know. Quinn comes close to that from time to time. <laughs> We're talking about the governor, Governor Pat Quinn. Have you met him? Mm-hmm. Do you think he's a reasonable guy? Do you think the Republicans could pass some of this legislation, maybe get some Democrats to support it, and then get Pat to sign some of the stuff we're talking about? I think he's well intended. Um, I think that this election, I believe that even on the Democrat side, I think there will be more pressure uh, from voters of, of all uh, ends of the spectrum to really get something done. And I think that the governor, uh, if that is the case, it'll, a lot of it will depend on what kind of people get elected. Well, would you, uh, who would cycle. you like to see run for governor in 2014 on the Republican side? Oh, I haven't even begun to think who about that. Who did you that. support in 2010? Uh, I uh, supported Kirk Diller. You did, okay, in the mm -hmm. Republican primary. And mm -hmm. then when Pat, when Bill Brady won, you supported right. Bill? Okay. Absolutely. And Absolutely. Do you think there's a chance that the Republicans could take the majority in the state Senate in 2012? Uh, you know, I uh, I think so. I think, as you know, with the Democrat control of the map, it makes it very, very difficult um, for the Republicans to. to what is get it now? There, I, I mean, when when Chris Redonio took that position, wasn't it thirty-seven twenty-two in favor like of the that, but it's favor like the Democrats? Tw it's twenty-four thirty-five. Thirty-five. Like that. Okay. Yeah. So they would need to pick up seven they have to seats. Pick up six. Six I seats. Think six to get even. Okay. I think that's in that range, six or seven. Well, six, if, seven, if they've got 29 eight. now and right. they picked up six, then well, that would 24. seem to give them 35. Well, they've got 24, so they need I to pick so. up seven. That Pretty sure. could be right. If they've got 24, they need 30 for a majority, so they just need six. 24 right. and six right. make yeah, 30. That's what I said. I was having trouble with the math. <laughs> you helped me for a minute. All right, so they pick up six Senate seats. They got the majority, right? Mm -hmm. And you think, you think it's going to be difficult to do that given the map was controlled by the... Right. For I, think it's, I think it's very, it's never Democrats. impossible. And I, and I think that uh, there still needs to be um, a strategy in place to do that. You can never stop working towards that goal. But I do think the Democrats have, you know, obviously they drew a map uh, to make that as difficult on the Republicans as they mm -hmm. possibly can. We need to change the way how, the way redistricting works in this state. You think there's any chance you could do that? I mean, that's set by the Constitution, right? Um, you know, I think that's a, that would be a great the question for the voters. What do you think they do? I think they would vote in a heartbeat to change to the To change that, both, both on the congressional federal level right. as well as on the state level. We should do a whole show on that. We're not going to do it today. Let me go back. I forgot to ask you about guns. You did ask Con me about guns. No, but one thing, concealed carry. You'd be in favor of concealed carry? I am a supporter of concealed Illinois carry. Illinois is one of the few states without any type of provision for concealed carry, it's right? It's the only one. Maybe the only state. Yep. And you would say if a person's licensed, a person's trained, they ought to be able to carry a gun that's concealed. Correct. They ought to be able to go in a bar with a concealed gun, right? If they meet the qualifications. If they meet the qualifications. They ought to be able to go in a church with a concealed gun, you think? All right. And as far as you know, you and Cliff are mano a mano, side I by side so. on that? Okay. So people are probably asking, well, if they're going to have this debate, if we're going to have you and, you know, Cliff... Uh, together, <laughs> it's going to be a pretty dull show, Joe. <laughs> Half an hour. What's the difference? You know, viva la difference. Where is the difference between you and Cliff? <laughs> I think I think the difference between my opponent and myself is um, I actually have the experience uh, as chairman of the fifth la largest county for the last seven years. Um, I've just I've just led the county through a tough economy, and during that time, we were able to 
hold the line on taxes. We uh, we've cut uh, the portion of the the property tax bill from uh, seven percent to something less than five percent, about twenty five percent cut back on that. We've cut um, our budgets. We've cut our head count. We've maintained sufficient reserves. We use less than twenty percent of our debt capacity. Uh, and, and we've managed to continue to provide the same uh, high level of So you of take service. the credit for that, for Absolutely. having an efficient, well-run, well-organized well, King County Board? Both bond rating and agencies, yeah. S&P and Moody's, raised our, our bond rating in 2009 in the middle of the worst recession this country so has ever the best, seen. who's the best person to continue that tradition? As you know, running in the Republican primary for the right to be the Republican nominee for the Kane County Board would be? Who are the two major figures? Uh, that would be uh, Kevin Burns and Chris Lawson. And who are you supporting? Nice try, Jeff. <laughs> you're not, you're not, you're not. I'm not getting in the middle of that. Really? I think it's very... I mean, you're from St. Charles, right? Right. Kevin right. Burns is from, from St. Charles. No, he's, he's from Geneva. Oh, uh, but it, well, he's, doesn't he live like right next to St. Charles? Well, Geneva and St. Charles, now see if like, you come to see the Cougars... They're really you, close. You'd okay. learn more about... He's almost a neighbor Charles. of yours. He's almost right. a neighbor of yours. Yeah. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas Chris lives way the heck out there in Aurora, right? Aurora is my neighbor too. All right. So you don't think you're any closer philosophically or otherwise to Chris Lawson or to or Kevin Burns? I, I think that those uh, those two individuals uh, will have their opportunity to discuss where they're at on the issues as they pertain to Kane County, and I'm looking forward to hearing. Um, a little bit more about that. One of that. those issues they've raised is the whole issue of campaign contributions. Right. In a sense, that involves you because right. you received over your 20 years, what, about a million and a half in campaign contributions? I don't, I don't know that that was the right number, but in any event. You've heard that number thrown yeah. out there well, by Chris, Mr. I Lawson's, think, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A million and a half dollars. Mm -hmm. You're not sure if it's right, but it's pretty close, right? right. Well, yeah. Reasonably close. Yeah, could be. Mm -hmm. And he says, look, there are a lot of things there where people can influence you, contractors, construction, and you were chair of the transportation committee. Right. Transportation committee makes decisions that affect people like Patrick Engineering and so forth, right. and they've given you large sums of money, 10000 11000 things like that, mm -hmm. and they're not the only ones. Mm -hmm. What do you say to Lawson mm -hmm. about that? I'd say, first of all, let's look at the facts. When I became chairman, the first thing I did was uh, impose my own a cap on uh, fundraising contributions for anybody who does business with the county, long before the state What's imposed the one. 750 uh, per year for any individual or corporation. So how does Patrick is, Engineering end up giving you $11,000? Isn't that what they gave you? I don't, I don't know. know. Did, you, like that? did you go through that? Yeah, I think so. Let did me you? See. Okay. Does that sound number, number sound right? No, it doesn't, but in any event, can I... I'm sorry, 10000 yeah. I was off of... But I think it's 10000 I've had some people look at that. Okay. I think that's well, supported you know and corroborated. I'll, I'll go back I've and heard others make that allegation. I'll, I'll go back and look at that. But, but you think that so you think you've given a lot less, or they've so given you a lot less than ten thousand? So something I, closer right. to seven hundred and fifty dollars. Well, you know, and I'm happy to okay. you know go through all of that with you. But let's talk about the facts of what I have done. So I put those into place. When I became chairman, we had no procurement ordinance. We had no procurement office either for the county at large or in transportation. One of the very first things I did was set up a procurement office that is completely separate from the office of the chairman. I have absolutely no involvement in uh, the selection of contracts. But all those people report to you. You're Kane County Board Chairman. You've got to have influence over people on the procurement committee who make those decisions, I don't, right? I don't cast the vote. I don't vote. I don't influence. But you're influential. Kind of I mean, you think people who work for the Kane County Board or the Kane County government look at the person who's chairman of the board as just another person? You don't think but they it, say, well, if that person, you know, is getting money from this, well, maybe we want to this, please them? Well, think this through, Jeff. If that was the case, that would mean I'd have to tell them, here are the folks that, that support my candidacy. People support my candidacy. No, Lawson says it's simple. Uh, just don't take money from those folks. Isn't that what he says? People support me. Isn't that, isn't that what Chris Lawson says? I have no idea what Chris is saying. Oh, you've told me. You've listened um, to what Chris and they battle and Kevin and all that. I mean, well, you know, no, right? I mean, to, to those two battling. But Chris yeah. and I have not had a conversation okay. about this. I, I receive a lot of support in the business community because I understand what's important to the business community and what we need to do in government in order to support a stronger local environment. So if you were on a similar committee in the state senate that had substantial control over construction and engineering and so forth, you would have no qualms about taking substantial contributions in 10, 15, 20,000, assuming the law permitted that. Which the, law not the law doesn't permit that. But assuming it did, it. would you have any qualms about doing that? Would you say, I would you not just what? do I it think, voluntarily? I think that, that anybody who contributes to your campaign should be on the basis that they believe in what it is that you do, what your philosophy is about government. And so just, no, just philosophically, would you, you know, there's some Republicans who say, full immediate disclosure, 
no limits, no caps on contributions. That's what we should have. You agree with those folks? We have, we have pretty immediate disclosure now. But not, not like 24 hours. Sometimes it's like six months that people find out. I, I, I think, I think um, real-time disclosure is... Would you like 24-hour disclosure? Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. I think that's a good thing. And if we do that, really would you say, thing. I know we have limits now, no limits. Give whatever you want. Just don't, limits just have full thing. You agree with the limits? Well, of course I agree, I agree with limits. I self-impose limits before the state. But you're, you know, you've received from McConaughey Properties. Is that a family business? 24,000 or something like that over the years? So, that, so, right? that would be my, our, our company. Right? And, and should you limit what you yourselves or your family business gives to you, do you think, or, or not? You know what, I think, um, you, know, that's a, you know, that's a question I haven't thought about before. Um, but I think that there probably needs to be limits that apply to any place that you get your funding. We're going to continue to, the, we're going to, continue to speak as the credits roll, but I very much want to thank Karen McConaughey. She, of course, is the current Cook County current Kane County Board <laughs> Chairman, I would say Chairperson. She is running for the Senate seat, which is essentially an open Senate seat. She's running in the Republican primary, 33rd Senate District. One of the other person running is Cliff Surgis. He's been on, she's been on. We hope you'll both come back for a debate. Sound reasonable? It sounds really reasonable. I've key, enjoyed it. And a key issue I've left out, education, school vouchers, school choice. Would you support that? Absolutely. Okay. In a heartbeat? In a heartbeat. Throughout the whole system of Illinois? Mm-hmm. Full, fully funded school vouchers. Say for Chicago, we currently spend about $15,000 per kid per year. A lot of people don't realize, 15000 per kid per year. Would you like to say, and that includes state, federal, local, would you like to say to those parents, to the extent you could as a state legislator, you know what, take that money and go to the school of your choice. If you want to stay in the public school, fine. If you want to go to a private school, fine too. You sign Absolutely. on to that? Absolutely. Same thing with all folks in your 33rd Senate District. Whatever you're spending, say you're spending 10000 per K through 12 on average, 12,000, say it's 12,000, take that money, stay in the public school or go to the private school of your choice. Right. You're backing this guy, Milton Friedman, who came up with school vouchers. He suggested, I think, in 1962, maybe 1952, you and Milton are soul brothers on that issue, right? <laughs> Never thought of it that way. Soulmates. <laughs> He's, of course, passed away, but I'm sure he'd be glad. And now in school choice, you're familiar with this book by the Heartland yeah. Institute, Herb Wahlberg, right? Yep. I have not read it. And it's not just a book, as some people good. think, when we discuss this with the Sun-Times editorial page editor, there are like 50 or 100 studies cited here, so it's not like one finding, it's like the findings. Are you convinced that charter schools as well as school vouchers outperform traditional public schools? Absolutely. I've seen okay. it. You've seen it. Mm -hmm. Not just some anecdotes, but then the studies that show, on average, there may be some where they don't, but on average, people have do much better, have much better education in the charter school or school voucher, right? right? Absolutely. So you're do. basically a free market conservative. I am. And you would like to say that what that government which governs best governs least? You bet. All right. And so the difference between you and Cliff, you're saying, is just a matter of leadership, a background, experience, but in terms of philosophy, you're pretty much in sync. Probably. I think it's a it's an issue. He would leadership. say he'd say you're too establishment, okay? He would say you're too much of the establishment. He's the reformer.